I never come to this pulpit without being subdued and humbled, and I invite your faith and prayers. Some time ago, I was walking in the center of Salt Lake City on my way to City Creek Canyon, where I usually walk every day. I follow that regimen since I had eight bypasses in my heart and do so under some gentle urging from my doctor. Car with an out-of-state license plate was driving by. It pulled over and stopped. The driver said, where is the Church of the Mormons? I assumed they were thinking of some place or building. I took time out to point out the church office building and the church administration building and the magnificent temple and the historic tabernacle, most of which were visible from our vantage point. They thanked me and went on their way. May I now ask you the same question? Where is the church? Is the church our beautiful chapels, most of which are so well maintained, so neat and clean, and of which we are so proud? The church cannot be just our chapels because for several years, in the beginning of the church, we had no chapels. We only had a temple. So, if you were asked, where is the church, would you answer, the temples? A few years ago, on a beautiful Halloween evening, my wife and I were in the temple in Kirtland, Ohio. In the late fall afternoon, the sun was streaking through the old, wavy, hand-blown window panes. The building was light and airy and magnificent. Since some of my forebears were involved in its construction, I was humbled and honored to be under its roof, within its walls and under its spell. I was enchanted by its beauty. I was so impressed with the building that I came back to church headquarters and told the brethren it would be wonderful if that building were still operating as one of our temples. Elder Packer corrected my thinking when he said, We do not have the building. But when our people left, they took with them that which was important. They preserved the keys and the ordinances, the covenants and the endowment, and the sealing power. They took with them all of the essentials which we have today. So, the Church cannot, in and of itself, be the temples, magnificent as they are, because the temple buildings alone do not bless. They are the exquisite containers for the pearls of great price administered therein by the priesthood of God. For the past several years, I have assisted President Howard W. Hunter, who was assigned by the First Presidency, to acquire land in Jerusalem and direct the building of the Jerusalem Center for Near East Studies of Brigham Young University. We worked very closely with President Jeffrey R. Holland, David Galbraith, Robert Taylor, Fred Schwendeman, and many, many others in this great endeavor. Through a series of miracles, the center came into being and is now being used by students of this university. The building is magnificent. It is a veritable jewel. 
None of us who have been involved can explain what we feel in our souls regarding that wonderful edifice. The building is so close to some of the places made sacred by the presence of the Savior. It is worthy of the holy city. It is worthy of this great university and its sponsoring institution, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But. The building alone does not bless. Now our great challenge is to use the building so that it somehow, some way, influences the lives of those who study there, who pray there, who worship there, and who change and become more worthy. The magnificence of the center alone may inspire, but our many educational facilities and activities on this campus and elsewhere will get no one into the kingdom of God. So where is the church then? Thanks to my wonderful wife, the Spirit of the Lord has often been in our various dwelling places. While we have lived within them, each has been a holy place for me. In our married life, we have lived in single rooms with bathrooms down the hall, small apartments, and we've owned three houses. In a sense, the church has been in each, but I would not want to go back and live in our other houses, even though we spent much of our happy lives in them, the kingdom of God is not there. Is the church then in our families? We are getting close to the correct answer here. In a sense, the family can foster the teachings of the Savior better than any other institution. In large measure, the Church exists to strengthen families. I wish to define family very broadly. In the Church, we have traditional families and single-parent families. All singles are considered, in a sense, to be a Church family. We also have ward families, of which the bishop is a spiritual father. Because of the erosion of family life and family values, we frequently hear urgent pleas requesting the Church to take over as an organization more activities that were formerly looked upon as family activities. For example, of this are the super youth activities, some of which have taken the youth at great expense and considerable risk to far distant places. I fear that in more than a few instances the cost of local church-sponsored teenage and single adult activities may have prevented some families from having vacations or other activities together. We also hear requests for a new program for that group, or a new organization for this group, or a new activity for the other group. We already have the new program. It is called the family. It includes family prayer, family scripture study, family home evening, and family loyalty. I wonder if our maturing youth can hold everything together without daily prayer and daily scripture study. The family is the best environment to encourage both. It is my opinion that many church-sponsored activities could yield to family activities when there is a conflict. I believe parents have the right to decide when there is a conflict. I say this because I am persuaded that family activities can be more effective in fostering eternal values of love, honesty, chastity, industry, self-worth, 
and personal integrity than any other institution. Lou Holtz, a successful football coach from Notre Dame, who's number one, I think, in the country, I mentioned that to give him some credibility. <laughs> Recently stated, quote, the family is where our healthy values are formed and shaped. He stated, I know of no greater challenge or more important role in life than in preparing our children to take their place as contributing citizens. We cannot relinquish this most important responsibility to gang leaders, drug leaders, or even our own government. He continues, Nothing can destroy individuals or our country as quickly as drugs. It is not confined to a segment of our society, and it has created more damage than anything else I have witnessed in my lifetime. I have never heard a successful man or woman get up and say, I owe my success to drugs and alcohol. He continues, yet I know thousands of people who have said publicly or in the press that they have ruined their lives because of drugs and alcohol. Suffice it to stay, say, government can't stop it, the police can't, but the family can, end of quote. Because of the complexity of the drug alcohol program, some may feel that it is an oversimplification to say that strong family leadership can solve the problem. Certainly not all families can, but I am persuaded that families with enough internal caring, discipline, commitment, and love somehow, some way, can handle the majority of their problems. <laughs> However strong or weak the family may be, it can usually provide a better solution to most challenges than can any other institution of society or the government, no matter how well-intentioned they may be. I believe the principal reason that a caring family is the best antidote for drug and alcohol abuse and other problems is because of the unqualified love that can flow from kinship relationships. In successful families, there is usually a strong, caring head. Ideally, this would be a holder of the priesthood whose power and influence is maintained by persuasion, by long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned. The home-based priesthood power is desirable because whomsoever is blessed by this power, God will bless. But there have been and are many successful caring heads of families who are mothers, grandmothers, and others. What seems to distinguish a successful family is that the members of the family continue to care. They just don't give up. They never quit. They hang together through divorces and death and other problems. We know of a large, close-knit family that is wonderfully successful in holding everything together. When the parents feel they are losing influence with teenagers, the help of cousins is enlisted to exert some counter-peer pressure. I would urge members of extended families, grandparents, uncles, aunts, nephews, nieces, cousins to reach out in concern to succor. Mostly what is needed from grandparents, cousins, aunts, and uncles is 
unreserved love manifest as interest and concern. This builds confidence, self-esteem, and self-worth. Reproving and chastening of adult family members should be rare indeed. We are told that this should happen only when moved upon by the Holy Ghost. But I have been grateful for those in my family who have loved me enough to give me both gentle and strong reproof on occasion as needed. We read in Proverbs, He that refuses reproof erreth. Because some do not have functioning traditional families is no reason to move further in the direction of diminishing or abandoning family activities for those who can and should foster them. With the increased onslaught of forces which cause families to disintegrate, we ought to dig in our heels to preserve all that is great and good in the family. We are reminded that in the time of tribulations the Nephites were not fighting for a political cause such as monarchy or power. Rather, they were inspired by a better cause, for they were fighting for their homes and their liberties, their wives and children, and their all, yea, for their rights of worship and their church. Some may find it strong doctrine, but I quote again from Alma in the Book of Mormon. And again the Lord has said, Ye shall defend your families even unto bloodshed. As a corollary to the defending of the family, there is a duty to teach family members that the commandments of God may not be broken without drawing a penalty. President Stephen L. Richards said, I want this taught to the youth so they may comprehend it. It is their due and their right to have these things given to them without dilution or apology. This is justice and mercy. Neither shall rob the other. President Richards goes on to state that it is no kindness to any youth to whitewash various sins, such as lying and deceit, which are so prevalent today. Quote, and perhaps the greatest of all, that robbery which steals virtue from either man or woman." Close quote. So the family is and must always be an important part of the Church. But the Lord's kingdom ultimately must be found in our own hearts before it can be anywhere else. Paul gave us a key when he said to the Romans, He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. He also said, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. In the story of David, who was called in his youth to be the future king of Israel, we learn how much the Lord judges by what is in the heart. We all remember how the prophet Samuel was sent by the Lord to the house of Jesse, saying, For I have provided for me a king among his sons. One by one Jesse had his sons pass before Samuel. As he looked for the future king of Israel, Samuel's instructions from the Lord were, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For the man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. As the seven sons passed before him, Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen this. Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, there yet remaineth the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. 
And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down until he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and with all a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Like Daniel of old, what we do and do not do in life originates in our hearts. As he stood in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, the great king of Babylon who captured Jerusalem, Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. The greatness of Willard Richard's heart was manifest just before the martyrdom of the prophet. Quote, Joseph said to Dr. Richards, If we go into the cell, will you go with us? The doctor answered, Joseph, you did not ask me to cross the river with me. You did not ask me to come to Carthage. You did not ask me to come to jail with you. And do you think that I would forsake you now? But I will tell you what I will do. If you are condemned to be hung for treason, I will be hung in your stead, and you shall go free. Joseph said, You cannot. The doctor replied, I will. Alma teaches us of the necessity of the good seed being planted in our hearts. Now we will compare the word unto a seed. Now if ye give place that a seed may be planted in your heart, behold, if it be a true seed or a good seed, if ye do not cast it out by your unbelief, that you will resist the Spirit of the Lord, and behold, it will begin to swell in your breasts, and you will feel this swelling motions, and ye will begin to say within yourselves, it must needs be that this is a good seed, or that the word is good, for it beginneth to enlarge my soul, yea, it beginneth to enlighten my understanding, yea, it beginneth to be delicious to me. Revelation comes to us in our minds, but it also comes in our hearts. In a revelation to Oliver Cowdery in section 8, the Lord says, Yea, behold, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost which shall come upon you and which shall dwell in your heart. To me it is very interesting that the dwelling place of the Holy Ghost is in our hearts. What if the Lord appeared to each of us as he did to Solomon and said, Ask what I shall give thee. How would you answer? Would we ask for a new car, a new home, a blessing of health, or a station in life? Solomon asked for none of these. He did not ask for fame or for fortune. He asked, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart. This pleased the Lord. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hath, hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment, behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, 
so that there is none like th thee before thee, and neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. Paul's prayer was that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. There is some strong language in section 64 of the Doctrine and Covenants regarding though who has claim upon our hearts. I, the Lord, we require the hearts of the children of men. So, when the inquirers in the car with the out-of-state license ask, Where is the Church of the Mormons? How should I have answered? It has bothered me ever since. If I had pointed to my chest and said that the Church should be first and foremost in my heart, the inquiring travelers surely would have gone away somewhat bewildered. <laughs> but, but, I would have been more accurate than I was by directing them to our beloved, magnificent, sky-piercing spires, the great majestic dome, and the other world-famous monuments and edifices, wonderful and unique and great as they are. I would have been more correct because the Lord said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is in our heart of hearts. And when it is in our hearts as individuals, it will also be in our great buildings of worship, in our great educational institutions, in our magnificent temples, and it will also be in our homes and families. Mostly what I want you to remember this evening <coughs> is that this humble servant has a testimony of the divinity of this holy work to which we have all been called. And I testify as one of the special witnesses and in the words of Peter when some of the early saints began to fall away and the Savior was troubled, the Savior said to the twelve, Shall ye also go away? Peter responded for the twelve and said, To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. We believe and are sure that thou art that Christ the Son of the living God, to which I testify in his sacred name, even Jesus Christ. Amen.